Welcome to another exciting message from America's pace-setting life coach, Dr. Dave Williams. After more than 30 years of leading a flourishing church and overseeing the establishment of over 500 growing daughter churches in America, Africa, and Asia, he has the first-hand experience that will help you succeed and be fruitful in your life's calling, whether in ministry or marketplace. Dave Williams is a teacher, coach, and trainer to successful pace-setting leaders. And now, Here's Dr. Dave Williams. This is the earth-shaking, legend-making, wall-breaking, city-taking Is God real? Yes. yes. Can I prove it? No. To a person who doesn't want to believe, I cannot prove that God is real. Are angels real? Yes. Can I prove it? No. Have I experienced an encounter with an angel? Maybe. Can I prove it? No. To one person, an experience may be valid. To another person, that same experience means you're mentally unstable. Do I believe in God? Yes. Do I believe in angels? Yes. Even though some theologians say that angels are nothing more than mere inspirations or sweet motivations or holographic wisps or just symbolic, a metaphor for the feeling of God's presence, I believe angels have personalities and they are created beings that are real and alive and in our midst. And there may be several angels in this place today. God created humans to bring him pleasure. He created humans and angels to partner together with him in his created order. Man working with God, angels working with man, angels working with God to achieve and accomplish God's purposes in the earth. Acts chapter 12, verse 1. I'm going to show you an encounter with an angel. And even though when people talk about angels, some say they're mad, they're insane. They did to Paul when Paul was talking about spiritual things and, and angels, when an angel came to him on a ship. You know, and he talked about the kingdom and righteousness and you need Jesus Christ as your Savior. They said, you've gone mad. You've been studying too much and your mind is flipped out. Even Jesus, the Son of God, his own family, here was the Creator, and his own family said, Jesus, you're mad. Because he saw angels. He experienced angels. He heard a voice from heaven, a voice of the Father. And they said, oh, he's hearing voices. He's mad. Peter experienced an angel, but he didn't know it was an angel. And today we're going to look at what do angels look like. Uh, next week we're going to talk about what angels don't do and what angels do do. Let's put it this way. What angels do and what angels don't do. What do angels look like? How do you know if you see an angel? I mean, I gotta admit, I've known people that every time it rains, they see an angel in the leaf of every tree. Every leaf of every tree. How do you know when you've had an encounter with an angel? Because angels are actively involved with us. I believe many of you, many of you 
are going to have an experience with an angel this week. Why don't we have more experiences with angels? Because simply, we don't expect them. If you come to church because you feel a sense of duty to come to church, but you feel, well, I probably won't get anything. You're just going get to get, get to church and get these guilt feelings taken care of. Done my duty to God and my country this week. <laughs> You'll probably leave empty, hollow. But if you came expecting something of God's spirit and something from heaven, you're going to leave rejoicing because you get what you expect. And we don't expect to have encounters with angels. And so many people don't have encounters with angels. They're not expecting it. They're not looking for it. They're not even expecting God to deliver them from certain situations. But Acts chapter 1, now about that time, Herod, the king, stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the churches. Here was the government that was stretching forth its authority to cause trouble to the churches. And so what did Herod do? He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he did that, he saw that it pleased the Jews and proceeded further to take Peter also. Verse 4. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison, delivered him to 16 soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison. But here's the right side of the butt, and I like the right side of the butt. Peter was in prison, but here it is. Prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth, here was, here was the night that before the morning where Herod was going to take the sword and take Peter's head off with that sword, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly, and his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. And so he did, and he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out and followed him, and didn't know it was true. Thought he saw a vision. Verse 10. They were past the first and second ward. They came to the iron gate that leadeth unto the city. Listen to this. Which opened to them of his own accord. You know, they didn't have those Kroger store doors back then. <laughs> you step on something and they open. Here, the gate just opened automatically when Peter and this angel got up to it. They passed through one street and forthwith the angel departed from him. The angel didn't wait for Peter to say thanks. He didn't wait for Peter to just rant and rave what a good job the angel did. You see, angels aren't interested in taking any credit or any glory. They are, they are so unlike humans. We usually want to hang around, maybe a reward, maybe a thanks, maybe a dinner, maybe something. Or if not, then we can just testify what we did. Get into a prayer meeting, testify. I just want to praise the Lord that God answered my prayers The, angel, the angels are not interested in angel books. They're not interested in angel series. They're not interested in, in they don't want any, they don't care about any glory or honor. We are to respect them politely, but they don't care about any praise. Well, anyway, the angel departed, and when Peter was come to himself, he said, whoa, oh, that's now, now. <laughs> I knew that. Now, I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. Peter suddenly realized that he had an angel encounter. All the while, he didn't know this was an angel until, he, until the angel was already gone. Many times when you have an encounter with an angel, you don't know you're having an encounter with an angel until the angel is gone. Then Peter knew, whoa, this was an angel. Now, every experience that we ever have has to be balanced against God's truth, the Holy Scriptures, the Bible. 
Any experience anybody has with angels has to be rooted in God's word, has to be judged by God's word. People tell me they see little dancing ballerina angels around the end of their bed with little wings and bare bottoms. And I say, look, it doesn't level with God's word. You had a hallucination. And again, one person's experience to another person means that person is insane or mentally unstable, unstable. I think I met an angel. Peter didn't recognize this person as an angel or this angel as an angel until after the encounter. But I was experiencing a great deal of anguish two years ago, maybe three years ago, and I was having a lot of anxiety and um, and confusion about what I was to do about certain people that seemed to be very rebellious, and yet they were people that, that were in the inner circle, so to speak. And I was getting to the point where I had heard so much that I was beginning, resentment and unforgiveness was rising in me and almost a hatred towards certain people. And, you know, as a pastor, I got to love the flock. But if I made... I was between a rock and a hard place. If I made a decision about these individuals, various families would be hurt. It could cause serious repercussions. And I was, I was just in utter turmoil to the point where um, I didn't know what I was going to do. The, the, the only thing I could see that I could possibly do was um, just... Just give up, throw in the towel, say, man, uh, Leviathan has won this one. And if you've ever had Leviathan released against you, that's an Old Testament name for a powerful demon that comes at you with his mouth. And if you ever uh, do warfare and get his mouth closed, then he swings his tail around and tries to get you with his tail. It's when one thing after another starts coming at you and bombarding your life to the point where you're under so much stress and strain and pressure, you don't know if you're going to make it. Somehow you try to muster all the faith you can. You know all the right things, but somehow you can't do it. And I was in that situation. And I boarded a TWA DC-9 in St. Louis, Missouri. I was heading for Tulsa. And I, I boarded the plane, and they gave me a seat on the side of the plane that has two seats. And I sat, and the plane loaded, and it seemed like it, we were all ready to go. Just everybody was on that was going to Tulsa, and it seemed like we were ready to go, and my seat next to me was empty. And I thought, well, great, I'm just going to stretch out. And then I saw this, this tall man. He was the last one to get on the airplane. He was, this tall man got onto the airplane. And he walked in real slow. And I looked at him. And the minute I looked at this man, something warm came over me. Something that said, I hope he sits next to me. He was radiant. There was something about this man. I don't know if everybody saw it or if I just saw it. But something was radiant and warm about this man. And as he approached, he looked around and he looked right at me. And as he looked at me, that was the first occasion. His eye caught mine. The thought flashed in my mind. And, and understand, th these thoughts don't flash in my mind like this. The thought flashed in my mind, I wonder if he's an angel. Now you understand, I'm at a, I was at a low point in my life, not many people knew about. And, and I said, I, I thought, now, you don't go to church or go to a restaurant and just, you know, automatically, I wonder if he's an angel, wonder if she's an angel. You, know, you, don't, you don't just do that. I don't know why I thought, I wonder if he's an angel. 
Just then he looked at me and he said, I hate flying this way. I, I was speechless. And so finally I got up the courage and every time he looked at me, this warmth came over me. It was, it was so undescribed. I can't describe it in human words. I mustered up enough courage to say, where are you going? Dumb me, we're on the plane to Tulsa. <laughs> now your normal person would have said, I'm going to Tulsa. He didn't say that. He said, th these were his words. He said, I just finished up my assignment in St. Louis and now I'm on another assignment. sat there and I just looked out the window. <laughs> he looked at me and he didn't say a word. But suddenly there was communication. Now, I will grant you, I may have been under a lot of stress that day. And I may have been hearing things in my mind. He looked at me. He didn't say a word, but suddenly there was communication. He started, if I can say it that way, telling me about the people that were causing me the greatest stress. And he told me about the deep pain in their lives the hurt they've experienced, the stress they were facing. And all of a sudden, these people that I was hating just a few minutes ago, all of a sudden, I was loving and crying and interceding for. Because now I understood. How could I understand? All I was doing is sitting there listening to thoughts. But he started telling me things about my life, things about other people's lives that... I needed to know. And so much, as, as this communication was going on, there was so much love. I just, I just felt so much love. I felt like I, I was bathed in love. And then I thought, I better write this stuff down. Now, if this was really a human being next to me, which it might have been, he probably thought I was a nut. Because as this communication was coming, I was writing it down. I've got several pages of things that were told to me on that flight between St. Louis and Tulsa that I thought this man was telling me. I wrote it down, and he told me to seal it up that, I, that what the, many of the things that he told me were not to be revealed yet. And then the wind was out of the north, and so we had to go around Tulsa and come in from the south. Now, normally, 99% uh, of the time in Tulsa, you land from the north. Their runways are always north, north and south. And you land from the north. There's rarely a, a north wind causing you to land from the south. But this day, there was that one, of, one of those rare days that the wind was out of a different direction and we landed to the side. It was probably the only time in my life, and I don't know how many times I've flown in there, probably 20 or 25 different times, and this would be the, about the only time that I can ever remember coming in from the south. But there was a reason for coming in from, from the south. Listen to me. We came around Tulsa, around to the south, and I looked out the window, and there was Oral Roberts University, and this man sitting next to me, pointed out to the window and said, that's Oral Roberts University. And I said, uh, yeah, I can tell. And suddenly, no more words, but communication began again. And he started telling me things about Oral and Evelyn Roberts, about the hurts and the pain that their family 
has experienced over the years and how it, most of that pain has come from people in the body of Christ. And all of a sudden, I saw all the hurts that this man that has been so ridiculed and persecuted and criticized, all of a sudden, it was like I could see all of his sincerity and all of his love for hurting humanity that he wanted to reach in, in the name of Christ and how the very ones that he was trying to help and reach, they did the same thing to him they did to Jesus. And all of a sudden I understood things about Oral Roberts that I didn't understand before. And I had so much love for Oral and Evelyn. And he told me, this angel told me, that he said, now you've heard Oral Roberts say that everybody's sick in some way. He said, if I could only lift the veil and show you how everybody hurts in some way, everybody would be kinder to everybody if everybody knew how everybody hurts in some way. We landed. All this is going through my mind. I've got pages of notes. I got, got off the airplane and I said, I'm going to wait. Just watch him get off. I waited and I looked. People got off, people got off, people got off, people got off, people got off. And that man that sat next to me, I never saw him get off. I went down to the baggage. I waited around by the baggage to get my bag. I looked and I looked and I looked and I looked and I never saw him again. Did I have an angel experience? I don't know. It might have been. But I know this. It changed my life at that point. It's amazing how angels always lift up Jesus Christ. They never want glory and honor to themselves. What do they look like? Well, if this was an angel, he just looked like a very tall man. Now, sometimes in the Bible, and because of the shortness of today's service, we're not going to have time to go into great detail, but let me tell you, sometimes in the Bible, they appear in their majesty, splendor, ministers, fire, flame, light, brilliance, illumination. And it's shocking. It shocked Daniel. Daniel could almost not stand it when the angel came to him in all of its heavenly brilliance bearing the glory of God, the glory of heaven. Daniel couldn't hardly stand it. Ezekiel saw angels that were so glorious he could barely stand it. But oftentimes angels appear just like human beings. More times than not. Think of this. In Hebrews, it said that be, be careful to be hospitable, polite, and respectful to strangers. Entertain strangers. Because in so doing, many have entertained angels without being aware of it. Now, look around this church. Do you know everybody in here? Guess who one of them might be? Do you know, look around, do you know every face in this church? You don't, do you? Guess who may be here today? Angels, unaware. Do they have wings? No. Cherubims are the only class of angels that have wings, and yet we know all, all angels can fly from one place to another real fast. I don't know how long it takes to get from here to Bombay, but they can get there pretty fast. Can you imagine seeing a foreign exchange student come to MSU, comes to Mount Hope Church, and you see this person, you meet this person, he's a foreign exchange student from Africa. That's what his assignment is. 
His name's Tommy M Mabutu. And you say, Tommy, you want to come over for dinner? You must be pretty lonely uh, here in America. My, I'll make you something. Come on over to dinner. And he comes over to dinner to your house. And, and then one day you get to heaven and you look over there and there's, there's an angel that looks a lot like Tommy Mabutu. And you go over and say, hey, aren't you Tommy Mabutu? And he says, well, that's what you called me when I was on that assignment on earth. You said, you mean you were an angel? He said, yes, I was. And you welcomed me into your home, and now I want to welcome you into my home. We're going to live among angels. Our next door neighbor might be an angel. An angel that you entertain when you go to the restaurant. Do you know that that waitress, you've never seen her before in your life, and you look at her, say, are you new waitress? She says, yeah, I'm new here. She may be an angel on an assignment. Angels come on assignments as, like humans. Abraham, when three beings came to him in the form of humans to let him know about Sodom and Gomorrah and what was going to happen, one was Jesus Christ, a theophany, a pre-birth appearance of Jesus and two angels. And, and Abraham was polite to say, hey, let me cook you some dinner. Come on, let's have some dinner. He entertained angels. I told my wife the other night, we're sitting at the kitchen table. I said, honey, I said, uh, you know, I'm studying about angels unaware that sometimes they appear as people you know. I said, you better be good to me because I might not be me. You may be entertaining an angel unaware. Angels have manifest themselves in glory. While I was preaching one day, I felt an unusual anointing of God's presence and power. And after the service, it was a couple of different people came up to me, and these were people who were stable and I knew to be spiritual. They weren't the kind that see angels and demons on every leaf or behind every door. And they said, Pastor Williams, when you were preaching, it was like a great curtain was lifted between time and eternity. And I saw two angels beside you. One was on the right side, one was on the left side. And when you'd walk, they'd walk right with you. Others have told me at times God will allow them to see into the Spirit. And I'll be surrounded by angels. And they can just kind of see through the angels and see me here behind this circle of angels. Don't mess with me. Sometimes God may allow you to peer through to the other side to encourage you, to show you the protection around you or around someone you love. Other times angels just come to you like humans. And you know, the, the uh, interesting thing is they may, may come very unsuspecting. They may not be what you... I mean, you think they're going to be dressed in a suit and tie and and their hair will be slicked back just perfectly, and they will have perfect builds, you know. <laughs> Not necessarily so when Ken Gobb couldn't get his car started. He wanted to get back to Yakima. It was the middle of the night. Sitting there, nobody around. Suddenly, here was a poorly dressed, grubbly dressed, elderly man knocking on his window saying, your van won't start, huh? And Ken said, no. And Ken thought this guy was a kook. And he was holding a tool box in his hand, this kook. And the guy said, want me to fix it for you? And Ken said, well, if you think you can. Ken said he couldn't do any harm. He Popped it open. Here the man worked under the hood. No light, not a flashlight, nothing. The guy's just working under the hood. Closes the hood and says, she'll start now. <laughs> Ken turned the key. It started right up. He tried to offer the guy some money. The guy laughed and said, what in the world would I do with that? <laughs> Ken just cried and thanked Jesus that Jesus loved him so much that he sent an angel to fix his car so he could get home to his wife that late night. And he looked, 
The man was gone. Didn't stay around to receive the glory. Sometimes they come dressed grubby. Sometimes they may be walking down the street with an overcoat just to see if you're going to be polite and respectful to them. When you get to heaven and you look over there and you see the old guy with the overcoat on that walked down the street and you look and you say, hey, you're an angel. Yep, you weren't aware of it though. I was on an assignment. I wonder how many people are in this room today that aren't really people, but they're angels. Pastor Williams, you've really flipped your lid. <laughs> we will be visiting you up in St. Lawrence. In the... No, you won't. I believe in angels. And you know what I'm expecting? I'm, ex I'm expecting more angelic involvement than you have ever dreamed possible. In your life, in your family life, there are what are known as harvesting angels. And that doesn't mean they go pick your wheat or your corn for you. That means they go out and start gathering in your family. Precious harvest. They're going out to gather them in. I have got so much in me to share with you. I'm learning so much more about angels. I have a deeper respect for angels, but I'll tell you what I don't do. I don't worship angels. As a matter of fact, I'm not even allowed to, and neither are you, talk to angels unless they talk to you first. There are angel seminars now that teach you how to get in touch with your personal angel. You go through these three steps and you get in touch with your personal angel. And you got people praying to their angel and talking to their angel like he's right in the room. You're talking to an angel, all right, a dark angel of Satan. You don't talk to good angels. They talk to you. Then you talk to them. The Bible promised angels around those who fear the Lord and be heirs of salvation. That's the point I've been trying to harp on for the three weeks we have been on this. Next week, I'm going to share more with you, but I got to tell you, I know, I know, get ready for St. Lawrence, you're saying, but I got to tell you of a dream I had. <laughs> Pastor Dave, you're getting like, you're getting like some old, who knows what, but <laughs> I had this really cool dream. You guys will appreciate it. But, I mean, I got up, I, I mean, I rose rejoicing. It, it felt like there were angels in the room. Um, it was the 8.30 service. There weren't many people in church. I got up into the pulpit and I said, okay, 8.30 people. So there was supposed to be a missionary here today, but he didn't show up, so I'm going to preach. Just then some guy over in this section stood up and said, oh, I'm here. And I said, well, just sit down. You didn't meet me where I told you to meet me, so you lost it. I'm preaching. <laughs> you know, he was back there. He had an easel and charts and everything, and I thought they'd be boring anyway. But <laughs> I started preaching, and then it was as if an angel said, said to me, call all the leadership of the church and get a prayer cover over the people. And I, and I said, okay, all the leaders, come to me, come here. We're going to march around this church and we're going to put a prayer cover over all the people in this place. And we're going to take their prayer requests and we're going to believe God with them and we're going to see miracles on their behalf. This is a dream, but I believe it's going to be a reality. And I said, come on, you leaders. And I got all the pastors and leaders and people that have been through leadership. And we started marching around the church. People were all in this. All of a sudden, hundreds of people started filing in, one by one by one by one by five by 10 by 15 by 20 by 50. 
and, and start filing in. And they were all writing out their prayer requests because suddenly faith came alive in the place. And they're writing out their prayer requests knowing that if we would agree with them on their prayer requests, that their prayers would be answered. And we're marching, and we got behind something like this curtain here, only it was a closet in my dream. We got back there, and some of the leaders started saying, I've got a stomach ache. I don't want to do this. Somebody else says, my legs are tired. Pastor Dave just works us too hard. And somebody else says, I've got a headache. And I thought about all these people out here, depending on the prayers of the leadership of this church, and I, something happened. I was, I was in the lead, and I heard all the griping back here. I felt like Moses. But only... I didn't intercede. I whipped around. I said, listen, you bunch of whiny wimps. <laughs> I said, we're here to serve God and to serve the people, not worry about our headaches and our stomach aches and our leg aches. I said, how can they have faith in the God we serve if we can't even muster up enough strength to march around and put a prayer cover over them. And it seemed like that was just what they needed. Some of them rose up. I suppose some of them still griped. I don't know. At least I didn't hear it. And we marched out there. And when we marched out from the closet, the 830 service was filled. There was standing room only. And everybody was waving prayer requests to us, saying, take my prayer request, take my prayer request, take my prayer request. Why? Because they knew that prayers were being answered in this place at the 830 service. <laughs> yeah, what are you going to do? Get up late, you miss out. The whole point is this. Angels are real. Angels are in this place today, but they're not here to be worshipped or praised or honored or anything like that. They're here for the purpose of ministering to you. But you know what? You got to be polite and respectful to angels because you're unaware of where they are and how they're manifesting now. God loves you. Jesus died on the cross for you. He rose from the dead. And part of the blessing of it all is he sent. Remember, it said God sent the angel for Peter. God will send angels for you. Not if you end up in jail because of your own fault. Peter was there because he was innocent. Angels are going to help you out. Angels can fix cars. Now, I don't know if they'll wash your windows. <laughs> and I don't know if they'll pump your gas on a cold day. But they might, that guy that pumps your gas. Now, I found at the base station, they pump gas on cold days. I go to bay. Yeah. <laughs> and I always give the guy a tip just in case he's an angel. I don't, you don't normally tip station attendant. But I always give him a little tip. I say... There you are. Thank you so much. You saved me some freezing cold, and I, I, and I, I just thank you. And someday if I see him in heaven, find out he's an angel, I'll be glad I gave him a tip. <laughs> Angels all around. Christians should not see more demons than they see angels. If they see more demons than angels, their mind is on the devil. We hope this message has encouraged you. This series continues in the next message. For more information about Dr. Dave Williams or to access the latest resources, please visit www.davewilliams.com. And now, for the entire Dave Williams ministry team, may God bless you richly. This is the earth-shaking, legend-making, wall-breaking,